Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Today we have Peter Krauth, former portfolio advisor and 20 year veteran of the resource market. Peter, it's great to see you again. Gentlemen, nice to be with you once again. It's been a while, so we're, we're glad to have you back. Yeah, happy to catch up. So, Peter, um, hey, the world's a mess right now, buddy. Um, <laughs> Russia's invaded. Uh, Ukraine, it's looking like the 70s all over again uh, economically. You know, what's a resource, in, what's a silver guru, what's a silver bug supposed to do in a situation like this? How did silver play out in the 70s? Do you have any interesting data you can show for us on that? Yeah, absolutely. So let me share my screen here. Um, uh, this is a chart that plots the S&P, the Dow, gold and silver during the decade of the 70s. And so right at the bottom here, you've got this blue line. It's actually on top of a red line, which doesn't show, but those are the Dow and the S&P. And then the yellow line is gold and the gray line is silver. So basically what this tells us is that stocks, as per the S&P and the Dow, were completely flat over the entire decade of the 70s before accounting for inflation. Gold was up 14 times and silver was up 37 times. So that means, say someone bought $1,000 of silver in 1971. Uh, well, that silver was worth $37,000 by, uh, by the end of the 1970s. Wow, that's pretty uh, amazing. I, wish, I hope it happens again. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're on our way. Yeah. Uh, so what's this next chart show? So this chart is performance of gold and silver versus stocks since 2000. So I think, you know, um, I was mentioning earlier that uh, I'm working on a book called uh, The Great Silver Bull. We're, we're a lot closer now to a release, probably a month and a half, a couple months away. Um, but I talk about this in there as well. And, uh, you know, most people think since 2000, stocks are the place to be. Well, this chart tells us otherwise. Um, since 2000, the Dow and the S&P are up about um, 200%, gold's up about 500%, and silver's up about 375%. Um, what perhaps is interesting to mention here is that silver always outperforms gold in bull markets. And we're certainly in a gold and silver bull market, so silver has uh, plenty of catching up to do even from this point. You know, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need a copy of that chart for when I'm discussing these things on Twitter because I need to drop that on people. Oh, <laughs> so, my pleasure. So, what's this next one? Since 2000, silver has been outperforming gold. Since 2020. Oh, 2020. So, I'm uh, sorry. Yep, yeah, that's okay. So this goes back to March of 2020. Uh, so silver is up about 45 percent, and that's before the the bottom. So silver is up about 45 percent. Gold's up about 15, 16 percent. If you go from the very bottom, uh, mid March, you're actually looking at a silver outperforming gold about four times um, in the last two years or so. We're almost there, two years. Um, and the gap uh, just in this year, since uh, the start of the year, stocks are down about nine percent. Silver's up nine percent. So that's an eighteen percent uh, outperformance already. My last one is uh, just this is a weekly silver price chart. And it shows that uh, on a weekly basis, silver is actually now breaking out above its 50-day uh, um, uh, moving, sorry, it's a 50-week moving average. And even yeah. if you look at it on a daily basis, we have a, a breakout of the, of the 50 and 200-day moving averages. So silver is clearly uh, aiming for a breakout at this point. Yeah, so uh, yeah, those, I've looked at similar charts, um, the 200-day moving average. I noticed that also the breakout was pretty solidly Last week, the 200-day moving average is in the low 24 area, around 24.20. And uh, here we are well above 25 right now. Hopefully, that doesn't change too much by the time this video <laughs> airs. Yeah, hey, we're, we're a solid dollar above the 200-day moving average. Well, now, That's are right. we now, I almost hate to say it. I'm going to say, are we overbought? I mean, we've been so, <laughs> so down so long, <laughs> it's hard to say we're ever overbought, but have we moved too far too fast? Um, I mean, at this point? yeah, I don't necessarily think so. I think that, you know, a bunch of things have come together at the same time. Uh, it has been oversold for a long time. Sentiment was in the toilet for quite some time. Um, you've got war in Eastern Europe. Um, I think another point, you know, that that's probably really interesting. I was actually chatting with uh, David Morgan uh, this morning and um, talking about, you know, what we think is driving silver right now. And frankly, 
I think that, uh, you know, there's this, I guess you could call it a phenomenon called inflationary psychology. And what happens is it takes a while. We've been dealing, we've been, we've seen real elevated inflation for about a year and a half, at least at this point, Mm -hmm. it takes a while for people, for it to set in, for people to, to really grasp it and believe, okay, this is here to stay for some time. And when it does, people start to think, oh, well, (laughs) I want to get ahead of this thing. So Mm -hmm. they change their behavior. They start buying certain things in larger quantities. They start to move larger purchases forward. And then you get a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes a a vicious circle. People see the inflation. They want to start spending more and sooner. That feeds the inflation. When it comes time to negotiate a, a raise, (laughs) <laughs> um, they, they, you know, they, they want to keep up with higher costs. So that gets passed on to companies. Companies have to pass that on for, through their products or services. I mean, it really becomes a, you know, a vicious circle and a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I mean, it really takes a while for something like this to, to eventually die down. And now you're layering war on top of it with supply shocks to oil, sh- supply shocks to all sorts of commodities, grains, um, you know, coal, oil, natural gas, steel, Fertilizer. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, this is like a perfect storm. It really is. For precious metals. Yeah. And counterparty risk. A lot of the banks, yeah, totally. you know, it's, it's getting tougher and tougher to export commodities. Even the commodities that are not sanctioned, oil, natural gas, palladium, because the world needs them. We can't sanction Russia on those. I've been reading stories lately that bankers and insu- bankers can't, won't issue lines of credit to uh, to export them. Insurance companies won't insure shipments coming out of Russia. Some shipping wow. companies won't even send their, their, their ships to Russian ports right now. So even though these things are not sanctioned and technically they could export them, there's physically no way to do so right now. Um, right. And so the world is, is really screwed up. I don't know how long it's going to take before you know, we get back to normal, but it is a perfect market for precious metals. I just, I've been calling the CEOs of the different companies I know, because they'll all return my phone calls now. Um, <laughs> and Sprott Money, the people at Sprott Money, Larissa Sprott, she told me yep. that they're seeing record sales right now. Um, and they're, 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 she was just so busy. They can't even keep up. Uh, right. people, are, people are rushing to buy this stuff. I talked, I had an email with SD Bullion. They told me the same thing. Uh, Silver Gold Bull, Bobby Belandis. Uh, he, he doesn't even have time to talk right now, but he, he just sent me a quick text message that he's overwhelmed right now wow. with demand. Um, well, for sure. You know what I was going to say, Jim and Ivan, is that obviously this is very reminiscent of almost exactly a year ago, right? The, um, the Silver Squeeze, except that was a, a burst right? And that was hard to sustain. This is a lot easier and more likely to be sustained. Oh, yeah, this I mean, could this go months. I mean, totally for, for this out. to calm down, let's, let's say they, 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 let's say they called it all off. Number one, I don't think Putin right. can call it all off. There's, he's got too much invested, too much pride. If he just turned around and said, oh, uh, my bad, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm back. I'm, let's, let's, let's do over. Um, <laughs> number one, it's not going to happen, right? Yeah, Very exactly. unlikely to happen. And I don't mean to make light of it. I do not mean to make light of it, but that's Completely. probably not going to happen. So there's going to reach some sort of stalemate or he's going to either overwhelm you, the U- Ukraine. They're not going to take these sanctions off. I mean, the, the sanctions from Crimea in 2014, those are still on seven, wow. eight years later. <laughs> All right. So these things don't come off quickly once they start. So this may be the new normal for who knows how long, years. Um, and I'm, I'm getting heated. I'm sorry. You're such a I mean, calm, I, cool, collect, you're such a calm, cool, collected guy, Peter. And here I am getting all excited. Well, well, Jim, Jim, I, I agree. I mean, just with what you were saying earlier, you know, that you've got shipping companies, financial institutions, even if the rules have not explicitly changed for them, they, they just don't want to touch this thing with a with hundred foot pole, right? They don't want to be associated with it. Well, so, it's like, the, 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 or the thinking is, if I were to take the risk to ship a big old boatload of palladium or whatever, or or right. some commodity out of Russia, what if while in transit or in the process, 
all of a sudden it does hit the sanctions list. Now, that's who's true. out there? I mean, that's why insurance companies don't want to touch it. That's why traders don't want to touch it. They don't need the grief, right? Who that's needs right. the grief? I've got to say one 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 sort of uh, working narrative or scenario that I have in mind is that maybe the idea for 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 Putin is to um, to weaken uh, Ukraine sufficiently to to stall you know any kind of um, I guess threat or potential threat that he sees. In other words, attack um, communications, attack uh, the military slow things down enough, at least, in order to, uh, I guess, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's any kind of resolution, cert for sure, but mm -hmm. it may be something that lasts a few months and, um, and, it, and is enough at least to kind of, I guess, like I said, weaken in some ways, yeah. you know, weaken the so-called enemy. And uh, yeah, I mean, but, but like you say, a lot of these sanctions could last well beyond that. And, and it would be no surprise at all. And the, and mm -hmm. the you know, the lingering effects could, could last for quite some time. So Peter, uh, you're, you're well known for your analysis on individual stocks also in the silver sector. So let's just go through a few of the big names or the exploration or junior producers. And I wanna get your take on a few of these names as like most of our audience is into physical silver, physical gold. Um, about two thirds, seventy percent of our audience also plays in the uh, in the in the stock space, also. So that's why we love to get your take on some of these names. Um, so we talked about this beforehand. Suma Silver, Tonopa, Nevada. What's your take on that company? Um, I actually recently uh, wrote them up. I, I really like them. Uh, they've basically got the eastern half of the whole sort of Tonopa um, district. Uh, with BlackRock having the the western half, and um, so they have a good land package. It's quite large. Uh, they've been drilling as far as I believe it's three kilometers east of um, east of uh, the old Belmont mine, and uh, they're getting some really high grades that far. My memory serves me right. That is an area that has this is all sort of first first drilling it's ever seen. So it's actually quite uh, quite exciting and quite impressive how 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 large this um these uh these this how far this mineralization actually seems to go and at high grades so yeah i mean and they've also got a uh, an interesting project in uh neighboring new mexico and uh that's a former uh, it's an it's a historic high grade silver mine as well so between these two properties um yeah suma certainly has uh, a lot going for it and so the next one I wanted to ask you about is BlackRock Silver. Uh, what do you think of this company? Also in Tonopah, Nevada, just like Suma Silver. I mean, the difference is, I'm going to say that uh, obviously BlackRock is on the western portion. It's uh, western, west Tonopah. But uh, the difference is that uh, they're more advanced. Uh, they've done a lot more drilling uh, to prove up, and they're getting close to a, um, to a, a resource. So that's actually, uh, you know, pretty exciting to to watch for. Um, you know, certainly uh, jurisdiction is is has a lot um, carries a lot of weight, and um, some exciting stuff uh, coming out of uh, coming out of BlackRock as well. Keith Newmeyer, the CEO of First Majestic, he's invested twice now in this company, and right. uh, I mean, I, I I think it's pretty. I'm not going to say he's going to buy the company, but. I don't know. You don't you don't invest multiple times if you're not really, 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 really interested. And he's got his Jarrett Canyon also in Nevada. It seems like he's building up assets in Nevada. So just something to keep in mind that big majors are looking at BlackRock Silver uh, very closely right now. And uh, I, you know, full disclosure, I own a position in this company also. So. so the other one I wanted to ask you about was Sierra Madre Gold. Sierra Madre Gold and Silver. What is your take on this one? Um, two projects that are, again, very interesting, similar to, to SUMA, uh, both being advanced uh, quite, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, La Tigra has recently had uh, some uh, trenching uh, going on there uh, and some mapping. And I know that uh, they're, they're really working uh, pretty, uh, pretty diligently to, to get that uh, moving forward. And they have a, um, uh, a spoken hub uh, model that they want to build out. 
So that along with the, the, the Tepic um, certainly is a great start as well for them. So I think that, uh, you know, this is one to keep, uh, keep in mind, uh, good jurisdiction, a um, lot of uh, silver from this area historically. Uh, Sarah Madri has, uh, ha has some great, uh, great assets that, uh, you know, um, should do well going forward as well. And another project that I like a lot that I wanted to ask you about is Silver Hammer, uh, Morgan Lextrom. This is in Idaho and Nevada. What's your take on this company? So uh, they have uh, a rather advanced project in Idaho, Silver Strand, um, former mine. Uh, they're, they're drilling from underground, getting some really nice results there as well. And so the interesting, um, I guess the interesting aspect with that is that they're closer, as an explorer, they're closer to, you know, becoming a producer than many of the other sort of junior explorers. So that's that's an interesting uh, sort of uh, angle, and then they've got a couple of um, a couple of projects in Nevada, Eliza and Silverton. Uh, now those are, uh, I think the it was the Eliza that's actually close to uh, a, a very large uh, producing area, um, going back uh, many decades. So that uh, also some high grade stuff. Uh, Silverton also, I mean, both projects are are, are attractive. Um, nice grades and, and again, great jurisdiction. I just think that, uh, you know, um, jurisdiction is actually quite a big thing these days. And uh, yeah. I like both Idaho and, um, and, um, and Nevada, certainly for places to operate. Well, you know, that's the key thing is there's so many problems in Mexico, Peru, even Chile now is becoming an issue. Heck, maybe even Canada is an issue. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, a company like this, Silver Hammer, in Nevada, Nevada is by far the number one jurisdiction. And right. from what I've read and everything I've heard talking to the geologist, this Eliza project, Silver Strand, you're right, very close to production in Idaho. Um, it could turn into a production within a very short period of time if they decided to turn it on because all the infrastructure is already in place and everything's right. extremely shallow. But Eliza is in. This, this was an 1800, 1880s mine, right? and they just scratched the surface of it. And they, they had some insane grades, 25,000 wow. grams per ton between 1876. And, eight, and literally, back then, all they did was pick and shovel what they saw from the surface, and they followed it. They had no idea how to do all the, the drilling and the geomagnetic magnetic surveys to find out where the real ore body was. It's like they maybe grabbed two or 3% of the silver that was there and they thought they were done and they left all the good <laughs> stuff behind. Exactly. I mean, the potential yeah, I mean, there is insane. It is, it is some, some really, really uh, exciting upside uh, at, at, that, uh, at that project for sure. So another company is James Anderson's uh, company, Guanajuato Silver, or G Silver for short. Now, this is a they. This is one that's really exciting. They just took this from concept. Basically, they bought a mine uh, from I forget which company. And Endeavor. They, and was Endeavor. it Endeavor? All right. And Endeavor spent a couple hundred million dollars to see everything you've got on the screen here, and then exactly. they were doing it wrong. Uh, or they they went about it the wrong way, and they didn't have enough ore to actually do it efficiently. What G Silver did was they put two mines together, right, to have enough ore. What what's what's your take on Guanajuato Silver? Yeah, so um, yeah, it's basically uh, you know a different uh, a different approach to the same mine, um, taking the mine, and they spent some money to do some upgrades, and they basically are mining this uh, this ore more more in a more targeted way so they're moving less ore and they're moving higher grade stuff so it allows them to be profitable and obviously because they you know they got all this these assets at such a great price with uh, amazing uh you know i guess advancement in the mill um and then they just had to do a little bit of upgrading really it uh, it allowed them to become um cash flow positive very quickly uh, that was actually confirmed in the last uh, month or so. And uh, that was actually added uh, to um, the Silverstock investor portfolio about uh, 
a little over a month ago, and uh, I think we're up like 35 or 40%. So the next company I wanted to ask you about is Dolly Varden Silver. Now, if I remember, they just did uh, uh, some sort of purchase asset agreement uh, expansion to buy the Homestake project from Fury nearby. What's, the t- what's your take on this company? Yeah, so um, the nice thing is that uh, it's essentially adjacent to their uh, prior uh, project. And so um, this is certainly a more advanced project. That's interesting. Um, there's some, some higher gold content, but overall still quite uh, a good silver content. And the so the nice thing is consolidating all of this. That certainly makes... Um, you know, for a lot of potential synergies as you go forward. And it also allows them to, uh, I guess, follow up on the area in between um, Dolly Varden's prior projects, or, you know, they, which they obviously still have, but prior to this, uh, to this, um, to this merger, merger and, um, and with the home stake. So now this area in between, they can actually start to, to look at and look for continuity between, the, uh, between, these, uh, between these areas. So, yeah, so they've, could, they've, think, they've essentially created a, a much bigger project to remove the fences and uh, go about it much more efficiently for defining the resource. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And this thing could grow uh, dramatically, actually, from this point. Yeah, I, I know that Sean Kunkin was very excited about this uh, uh, expansion. So, uh, yeah, it looks like good things coming. So Peter, thank you very much for uh, you know sharing some some of your knowledge with our audience. We really appreciate it. The audience loves you. Your videos always perform well, and let's do it again in about three months. I look forward to it. 